Good evening and welcome to lesson 12 of CE3372 Water Systems Design Fall 2020. And before we get into the actual lesson itself, um, I'm going to uh, walk you through a few of the um, recent additions on your exercise and, and exam stuff on Blackboard. Uh, so that you're aware of it and you're aware of the uh, various due dates. This uh, this morning's um, lesson, the video failed during the recording. So I'm going to be talking somewhat painstakingly slow because I don't I'm, I don't have a backup for this one. This is the backup, unless it fails here too, then it never happened. Um, so let me take a quick look. I got 11 participants out of 15 or 16. That's actually a pretty good turnout. Um, I'll leave my lovely picture up in the corner with the beautiful background of the town square in Bremen, Germany. Um, although it would be dark there right now, uh, quite dark. Um, let's see, six and six, it's one in the morning-ish. Um, and so here we come to Blackboard, and I don't know if you all as students are victimized with all this garbage that uh, gets in the way. It's all fun and games until you actually have to do something. And I believe we are section one, and is it going to refuse to connect? No, it's connecting. Um, it's in go slow mode. And in the uh, usual back Blackboard, in the category called exam collection, um, there's an exam posted. It's your exam number one. Uh, it's, it has a timer for 180 minutes, so three hours, which should be more than enough time. Um, unless, I, I can't imagine it would take longer than that unless something terrible happens to your network. Uh, if, if you go beyond the 180 minutes, it'll still let you submit your results. Um, if that's the case, just remember don't disconnect once the timer runs out. You'll need to you'll need to finish that session to uh, be able to uh, store the results. Um, and so using these timers is kind of new for me, so I, I, I'm experimenting with that in Blackboard. The last question of this uh, exam, there's there's 27 questions on it. The last one is a fairly conventional one that you would be used to from exams in other classes where you have a series of questions to answer in this case regarding a particular figure um, you would prepare your solutions and work your answers out on a piece of paper and then uh, what I'd like you to do to show your work is uh, photograph or if, if you're really anal you could typeset all that work convert it to a PDF file and upload it to the server and so that particular problem is manually graded. So once you turn it in and submit, the automated grading um, is going to tell you that uh, it, it, it couldn't do the last one. It may actually report a grade. Um, don't worry about that. I have to actually manually look at those answers and do a manual override. Um, so that's uh, uh, what, I, uh, what we have on the exam. Let's just take a quick look at the exam itself. Um, so I'll go ahead and pretend I'm going to take it. I'll get a zero on it. So it's it's literally a series of questions like um, that, and you have multiple choices, and you um, uh, select the question and then move on to the next one. It looks like it's programmed to show it one question at a time. I, I think you can still backtrack. Uh, the defaults in this software are completely confusing. And so you have a series of multiple choice questions like that. And I'm trying to figure out how to scroll through it. It's uh, currently in uh, various uh, quaalude modes. There's a few questions that are um, numerical answers. So you would enter the numerical value for the answer. Uh, it, it, it tells you what units to use, so be sure the numerical value is in the units that the problem specifies. 
um, because it doesn't do unit conversions. So if you were to enter 1 times 10 to the 6th gallons per day for an answer, and it's expecting a million gallons per day, then that number, 1 times 10 to the 6, is 1 million times too big as far as the computer grading thing is concerned. Now, I usually notice those when I go look at the scores, and if I, can, if I see that and detect it, I can do a manual override. But it's best just to um, do it in the units that are requested. So that's the exam, and let me see if I can get out of it. And um, you don't want to get this orange bar on the top of yours. Uh, it simply says you quit the exam without submitting it and save and submit. There's no point in contracting me for assistance if that happens because I can't give you any assistance. Not that I don't want to. I actually don't know how. Uh, so try not to get into this situation. Most of you have done the quizzes fine, so I, th I think uh, this is more than manageable. Okay. So that is the exam and stumbling through the terrible file management system. The other uh, new addition is exercise five. Exercise five is application of EPA net to a couple of problems. First is a simple network and then the second one is a somewhere USA subdivision uh, that we are um, working on as the pseudo design project for the semester. So the first one is uh, this simple network um, and it has the node and pipe data in the attached table and you're asked to construct a model. Uh, you're instructed to use Hayes and Williams head loss for the network so you'll have to go look up uh, Hayes and Williams coefficient for PVC pipe. Um, write the node equations, write the head loss equations. Now that's not an EPA net specific thing. Uh, that's in the context of network analysis. Then make a screen capture. Uh, produce a table of nodes and elevations and resulting pressure. Same thing for pipes. Tables D and E, both those can be constructed from tools that are built into the EPA net software. So where I was clicking the other night to get um, time series plots. Right next to it is something that looks like a little teeny miniature uh, spreadsheet. That's how you get table table construction. And so you can read the user manual and figure that out. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, and then F should probably come before uh, C. Um, you want to um, build these tables and stuff and flow rates for the instance where the head at node number one is 100 feet of head. And so node number one is here where the cursor is circling. And so you're gonna have to figure out how to uh, force the head of that node to be 100 feet. Um, you actually already know how. It, it was showed not explicitly, uh, but in the last uh, couple of meetings when we were demonstrating EPA net, um, there is a uh, fairly straightforward way to make the head there have a value of 100. I'll leave that uh, for you to struggle with and if you get really stuck somewhere in the page 125 and beyond of the user manual there be some meaningful hints there. Um, then you're asked to determine the Darcy Weisbach friction factor. That's a computed value that the program does for you. So you don't have to go and take the flows and use the Moody chart yourself unless you're crazy and really want to. Um, and then the last one is to report the head loss from node 1 to node 4, determine the actual head at node 4, and identify the nodes with the lowest pressure. Just, just EPA net exercise. Um, this is not a difficult problem and all told uh, after you figure out how to operate the software, uh, I, I imagine this whole problem moving slowly can be accomplished in a bit more than a half an hour. Getting the software figured out, that may, that may take some more time. The next one is to take our Somewhere USA skeleton system that we've already examined in a couple of prior exercises, and now we're going to 
produce a hydraulic model of the network. So the network is these blue lines and the various demand nodes are the blue dots and um, you'll have some uh, work to do because when you produce node elevations that was the whole point of the contour mapping exercise that you did earlier. Uh, the other whole point of that is that contour map will be very important in the drainage engineering part on this subdivision. And so um, a lot of this uh, narrative is, is repetition of earlier stuff. And so you've already produced um, demands for each node in a prior exercise. So by all means, reuse that. Don't uh, start all over again. And uh, you've also produced contour maps so you can get the correct elevations at each of the nodes. Yes, cat. What is it? You pick now to uh, become vocal. And so our task is using the uh, hydraulic simulator um, and RG195 in the San Marcos manual for any statutory requirements that you deem necessary. So as you're working through this exercise, there may be some information uh, that's not obvious, and so refer to either of those two documents to find the uh, missing piece of information. Um, so land surface map you've already done, and uh, then determine individual node elevations, and those will be entered into the program. So in the San Marcos manual, there is likely a minimal burial depth for water distribution pipelines. If it's not there, it's probably an RG195. So the land surface elevations uh, will be higher than the node elevations for your network. Um, I find it easiest just to put everything on the land surface and then go back and do a global offset because that's actually pretty simple to do um, uh, according to uh, whatever the uh, burial depth is for the jurisdiction. And then um, you've already produced average and peak demands in prior exercises and what the remainder is asking you to find the magnitude and location of minimum pressure at average demand, same for peak demand, maximum pressure at average demand, same for peak demand. Item 8 is if there's low pressure portions of the system that need mitigation. So maybe there's some parts of the system that are less, less than 35 PSI. Um, see if you can adjust pipe diameters and satisfy the pressure requirement in those regions. And then lastly, uh, apply a demand pattern multiplier to simulate time varying behavior in the distribution system. And the multiplier I would table I suggest you use is what we demonstrated last time. Um, feel free to go ahead and use that graphic in the, uh, in the lesson 11 presentation as a typical demand pattern multiplier uh, for application on this problem. And that uh, exercise is due on the See if it'll tell me what it's due. Oh, it's a piece of junk. It's it's I think it's due on the eleventh. Um, let's see what this guy says. Oh, it's not due at all. That's interesting. Okay, don't want to change the due date. Edit. Oh, quite interesting. It has the 11th is, yes, it's due on the 11th. I'm pretty sure the, uh, it's, that's the same for the other class. So we've submitted the due date, and um, you're all good to go on that. Now, exercise 6 and 7 have been created, but I've not uploaded them yet.
and you now have a large cat giving you your lecture, at least look at the camera cat. Say hi to the uh, studio audience. No? Um, if I'm lucky, I'll actually get to keep access to my keyboard. So moving to our lesson collection, we are in lesson 12 and we're beginning the stormwater collection part of the class and all that's in lesson 12 is simply a web link to the lesson 12 um, content server and uh, this lesson examines design manuals as tools to guide hydraulic design for stormwater systems. So we'll look at a few manuals. and. Um, that's actually all we're going to do in this lesson. Uh, the video links are not active. There is no supplemental data, I don't think. No scripts. Uh, so everything's contained in the notes. And uh, we'll look at um, these particular manuals uh, in, in a minute. Okay, so stormwater collection design guidelines, fall 2020. And um, our stormwater collection systems, these are systems whose purpose in life is to convey water away from a source to an outlet or release point at some desired location. And sources include parking lots, roofs, residences, and pretty much anything that produces runoff, uh, that ponds and creates either nuisance or um, damaging flooding would be uh, sources that we're trying to uh, provide stormwater collection from. Um, it's, so it's pretty much anything that has a hydrologic response. So that's a larger universe of possibilities than in the water distribution system design where we are bringing water from a source to a customer. Um, customers are quite a bit more uh, defined than the uh, stormwater generating sources. And the, the main goal in stormwater collection is, is actually dealing with that phrase right there. Um, uh, stormwater is a natural thing. It rains, some of the water goes into the ground, some of it goes up into a plant, the rest of it runs off, finds its way to a stream, to a lake, to a river, back to the ocean. That's what it's supposed to do. But we, as human beings, build communities that get in the way of that process. And so the consequence is, is that water can pond in our basement, um, garage, living room, and we don't want that. So we provide drainage relief to keep the ponded water out of built infrastructure that we want to protect. A secondary, although an emerging as bit as important as the ponding aspect, is we also want to have some influence on the quality of the stormwater. Because that stormwater itself is a resource and if we can preserve its quality, it can be used beneficially along its uh, arduous journey back to the ocean. The regulatory guidance documents, which are the principal tools in designing stormwater systems, um, along with our individual creativity and the owner's uh, access to right-of-way, um, are the principal uh, skill sets that we apply in stormwater engineering. Uh, one nice feature of the stormwater role is a lot of stormwater infrastructure is above ground. People can see it. So we actually get an opportunity in our, in our creativity to uh, apply influences of artistic and aesthetic design. Um, now, a storm sewer, which by definition is an underground pipe to carry storm water, that's still just a pipe in the ground. Um, there's, there's no aesthetics to that that you can, um, that you can leverage or exploit 
uh, to make the community a prettier place to live. But the uh, surface features can be exploited. One of the um, leading federal agencies that writes regulations that cover the construction, maintenance, treatment, and operation of stormwater is FEMA. Um, but the other agencies that have huge roles in this arena are the EPA still, uh, mostly for the water quality aspects, and um, they're, they're actually the agency that produces the leading computational tool for stormwater management. The United States Army Corps of Engineers, especially if that stormwater is discharged into or uses part of a navigable waterway for its journey back to the ocean, um, that's their um, legislative authority, is navigable waterways. The United States Bureau of Reclamation and a few others. Um, most letters of the alphabet that can be arranged into a federal agency have some impact on stormwater. Uh, so we have a much bigger collection of people whose fingers are in the pie and in our wallets when we're doing stormwater engineering. Similarly, in addition to the federal regulatory structure. Um, most, um, all states have a transportation department and nearly all states have a major stormwater component within that transportation department. Texas is no exception. And in fact, the uh, hydraulic design manual from the uh, Texas Department of Transportation is often used as the guidance document for counties that have small enough population that they can't afford to develop their own design criteria and so they revert to the state manual. Um, cities have their own manuals. We'll look at the Houston one because it's a pretty thorough example. And in the state level EPAs or whatever their equivalents are called, they're also charged with regulating aspects of the standards and permitting for stormwater infrastructure. So let's look at some representative manuals. I'm going to go first to the City of Houston manual, which is located on the server, or we could get it from the Google Net, but I already have a copy, and there's the manual. So this one is uh, circa 2012. Um, I would imagine that there's been a revision since then, because that's, that's eight years ago. Assuming um, I'm at home with a calculator, but I can't find it. And so we'll just uh, take some selected uh, journeys through this uh, manual. So uh, chapter one, they have general requirements. And uh, normally what the general requirements of these manuals is it uh, establishes authority to regulate the stormwater and provides a series of um, uh, references that are used in doing that regulation. So this has a whole list of references that you're expected to uh, use as a design engineer. It discusses the plat and the construction drawing process. It discusses submittals and how to obtain the various reviews. Um, it states what is meant by preliminary design, final design, signature stage, and construction and quality assurance. It has a set of requirements for um, boundary surveys and land elevation surveys that are to be used in conjunction with uh, stormwater uh, development. In this case, this is infrastructure design, so these, can, these apply to all infrastructure in Houston. Um, and actually tells what the file format is, uh, so point number, northing, easting, elevation, that's, that's, that's X, Y, Z, and using the northing, easting, that means they are implying that you're using universe, U and UTM, universal transverse Mercator projection. The point number is just the, uh, the, the point in the, the record number of the uh, file, and then there's a written description. Um, and we're, they also stipulate the minimum mapping that's required and so forth. Uh, in graphic requirements, uh, this part's pretty interesting because it 
stipulates exactly what has to be mapped. Service area on a cover sheet or map. Final design shall be an ink and mylar produced by um, a computer-aided uh, tool using non-water-based ink. Uh, details of special structures are drawn with vertical and horizontal scales equal, so the aspect ratio is 1. And as we're moving down through this, it has um, explicit definition of the scales. Um, furthering this as we're moving down, it actually has exactly what objects are represented by what kind of drawing. So it has a right-of-way line, um, it's line code 0, and it has line weight 3, and those are all tabulated uh, down here. Um, on the off chance that it's uh, working on a plotting table, it gives you the Keffel and Esler pen number um, to get the different weights. Um, in the case of a computer, it, you can provide the line weight in inches or in millimeters. And then the line code uh, refers to the different um, markings. And in the case of Houston, uh, there are some specific uh, lines that are reserved for different entities. So center, pay, center point energy has its own line code, uh, a portion to it. Uh, there should be an AT&T one if I can find it. AT&T conduit, a pipeline or Western Union conduit, you identify the owner. And then cable TV has its own line code, railroad lines, how to draw curves. So everything you had in your drawing class that you um, possibly have forgotten or initially slept through, whatever, um, is stipulated in the uh, infrastructure design manual. And there's pages of this. Uh, we'll be interested in culverts and ditches. because that, that will be a lot of uh, what we design when we do um, storm drains. And storm sewers are drawn pretty much the same as a sanitary sewer, except sanitary sewer uses a interesting line code 3. Hmm, I didn't know that. Um, but storm sewers uh, 24 inches and smaller are just drawn with a single line. 30 inches and larger are drawn with this double dash line. And something between 24 and 30 inches, I guess they just don't exist. Um, I imagine uh, you would make a engineering decision based on the busyness of the resulting drawing for those. It also has a profile view on how different features are to be drawn. The one we're interested in here is the uh, storm sewer manhole. So in elevation view, um, storm sewer manholes are drawn uh, wide at the bottom and tapering up to the surface. If it has a clean out, you're supposed to show the clean out coming to the surface. And um, that's about all I want to show there. I want to get the storm sewer profile. Uh, so profile, storm sewer profile views are oh, they're missing some of them. Okay. Well, again, uh, how to draw sewer lines, how to draw manholes, and how to show inlets. So these are uh, devices that collect water from the surface and convey it to the subsurface. That was graphic requirements. And then moving into the map making, it discusses what the platting requirements are. Um, uh, what the minimum expectations. Any future plans. And then the... Uh, uh, review process has a list of uh, minimal design analysis 
And that's um, so this item four, an analysis to demonstrate adequacy of drainage facilities. So four words uh, can create um, a multi-thousand dollar modeling project, and um, and that happens. These planning requirements, easement requirements. This is a land property uh, requirements to be sure that there is sufficient right-of-way to build the infrastructure. Utility locations, um, when uh, we build in a big city like, uh, well, any, any large city, there's already underground utilities. A lot of times we have to work around them. And it has a list of design requirements. Um, locate storm sewer in public right-of-ways if possible. Identify storm sewer lines by size, location, depth, grade, material on the final drawings. Also identify manholes, headwalls, inlets, and size materials on the drawings. So there's a lot of uh, required detail, uh, more so than we're going to do in this class. Uh, we'll be more at the conceptual design level in the class. And let's see those utility locations. Skipping. Chapter 9 is the stormwater design requirements uh, for uh, Houston. So as, as an example of a reasonably comprehensive document, uh, it establishes a policy on uh, what they're trying to achieve and right there is your design guidance. The combined system is to prevent structural flooding from extreme events up to a 100 year storm. Now this document is obsolete because the current um, regulatory criteria for Houston is 500 year storm and that that is a result of Hurricane Harvey and so what they did is rather than restudy everything and and correct where the hundred year regulatory plane is the uh, Department of Public Works and the City Council determined to be a whole lot easier and probably just as effective to change the 100 there into a 500 and the 100 there into a 500 and everywhere else 100 appears into a 500 25 minutes, um, 24 of it arguing on which way they're going to vote, and the 25th minute to uh, make the vote. So bearing that in mind, uh, this is obsolete uh, from that context, and it goes ahead and establishes different authority. Um, at the time, uh, in 2012, the principal tools for the Rainfall or TP40 or Hydro 35. So TP40 is a late 1960s document. Um, I would say somewhat obsolete now. Hydro 35 was from the 80s, also obsolete. These are most likely have been replaced in any revisions of the manual with NOAA Atlas 14, Volume 10, Texas. Um, but you as the design engineer would be obligated to uh, check that. Uh, there's also this HEC 22 manual, which I think the copy is on the uh, class server, which is called um, Urban Drainage Design. And then there's a manual practice from ASCE. We discussed those earlier in the semester. And at the time of the writing of this, the uh, accepted software was something called Hughstorm. And it's likely still available, but it's pretty long in the tooth. And much of what you do in Hugh Storm could be accomplished in Swim or um, the Bentley one. What was it called? Water Gems, I think is what theirs is called. And it refers to the uh, Harris County Policy and Criteria Manual. And then it discusses what a design storm event is in generic terms and different kinds of developments. So Mr. Nico, why don't you just lay down right here? I don't mind you being on there, but you're totally in the way.
And it has some other um, uh, useful definitions. Uh, it, it describes the different annual recurrence interval or probability uh, values for different design criteria that are articulated in the design manual. There you go. There you go, Cato. You can stay there, and that way you're in my lap, and you're sort of in the way, but you're not. And a few other uh, important definitions. So I would uh, say that this is a, a pretty thorough manual. Uh, they've had a lot of years and a lot of um, major disasters to, uh, to get it um, usable. Uh, in the case of design storms, it also stipulates a duration based on drainage area. So 200 acres or less is three hours. 200 acres or more would be six hours. Like see, more than 200 acres would be six hours. And they provide intensity duration curves. But again, this is a 2012 manual. A lot of this would be replaced with the NOAA Atlas 14 tool. It also um, states the applicability of runoff models. Uh, you're permitted to use the rational method uh, up to 600 acres. And anything larger than that, uh, you're expected to do rainfall runoff modeling. And probably the likely tool for that would be SWIM or HECRAS. SWIM is a better tool for this kind of modeling than HECRAS, um, namely because it was originally built for stormwater uh, system design. So it has some um, advantages uh, in that. But computationally, they both pretty much do the same thing under the hood. And it gives you um, background for the necessary hydrology. Moving on down, as you get through the requirements, it has some construction requirements for things that you build. And the last part I want to address is water quality, in that um, that is an equally important part of a stormwater infrastructure design is uh, providing um, infrastructure that enhances or preserves the water quality of the stormwater so that that water uh, retains its utility as a valuable resource. And I'll leave that for you all to read on your own. Trying to get out of the manual. Uh, City of Lubbock also has a uh, standard and specifications manual, and on the stormwater part, it's not nearly as detailed as the Houston one, um, but it, it has elements of that detail. Uh, let's look at the policy criteria and procedure manual, which is referenced in the Houston manual. So this is a county level manual, and uh, it too discusses um, authority and procedure and how to get projects accepted. By accepted, meaning you uh, um, they review it, they approve of the project, you pay an impact, an impact fee, and uh, it's like getting a permit to uh, build your infrastructure. In the case of the Harris County Manual, they have um, hydrology uh, that's uh, stipulated, and they discuss two different modeling tools. Um, anything bigger than a square mile, you're doing a watershed modeling. Smaller than a square mile, you can use these things called site runoff curves, which are a, a fairly clever implementation of rational method. And hydrology. Once you have your hydrology done, the hydraulics um, is stipulated how that's to be handled and what computer programs can be used. The Harris County doesn't say that you have to use HECRAS, it says you can use it. Um, there are other tools and SWIM is acceptable 
to uh, Harris County uh, because it's a FEMA acceptable program and you can't they can't um, ignore a federally accepted program however most engineering firms in Harris County use HEC uh, HEC grass um, HEC 2 is the older version of that and they have a set of uh, guidelines from the 90s on how to uh, implement those tools. Uh, they have prescribed what the different um, meanings and values to be used are, and they have prescribed what the channel acceptable channel velocities are. Um, they're sticking between actually, oh, I would four and ten feet a second. They're going a little bit above on concrete line because uh, those are more able to withstand uh, erosion. They have a description of cross sections, uh, starting water surface elevation, and so on. The manual tells how to deal with channels, stormwater retention basins, bridges, culverts, transition structures, erosion control, uh, Backslope drainage systems, which is specific to um, uh, detention basins and, and channel barriers. Uh, enclosing the channel, how to deal with extreme event overflow, how you are to deal with pipelines, utilities, and roadways. Um, the discussion on water quality features. And... Um, archaeological compliance, all this stuff is uh, things we normally wouldn't think of when we're doing a water system design. So having any of these manuals, even if they're not specific to your area of project, is good because it kind of provides a built-in checklist of topics that you need to consider as you're doing your design. And that will be enough of that manual. And like I've been saying, most jurisdictions have something similar. And so far we've looked at a city in a county manual. Uh, we're now going to take a look at a state one. There. Which I actually have in readings. Let's go to a, we'll look at the 2014 Hydraulic Design Manual. Um, it's no longer a current for the state of Texas, but the, uh, the structure is about the same. As before, it has an introduction, what the point of the analysis and design is, and they provide examples of why we have to do it. the governing policies and laws, the specific processes and procedures in the context with a state agency, uh, the scope of what the analyst needs to consider in doing a design, and a couple of um, examples. What needs to be documented, And we get down here, uh, that, that information all makes its way onto the design drawings or design report. Then it has a chapter on hydrology and the various tools that the uh, state expects one to use depending on the scope of the particular project. Um, has some guidance on how to uh, choose a method based on the size of the area as well as the um, uh, consequence of failure of the particular project. It talks about the National Flood Insurance Program and its role in hydrologic and hydraulic studies. Then it moves into hydraulics, open channel flow, 
flow and conduits. Um, and this is conduit flow, not necessarily pressure flow. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at both of those, um, not today, but in a future class. And hydraulic grade line analysis. Uh, so one of our goals is to determine in a storm water collection system the hydraulic grade line, which is where the water would rise if it, if it could get if it could get out. And so imagine this picture right here where the cursor is. If the top of this pipe, for the sake of argument, let's pretend that it coincides pretty closely with the land surface. So down here on the right side of the figure, we have the hydraulic, hydraulic grade line that's above the land surface. So if that water has a way to get out, it's going to cause ponding in that area. And so the whole point of it is to prevent that. So there's nothing um, fundamentally wrong with a hydraulic grade line going above the land surface, but that better not be a location where we have nearby manholes which provide an outlet for the water to escape the system. Well, likewise, getting water into the system is important. And so there's a whole uh, section of the hydraulics of that, and then they move into uh, various um, information about channels, culverts, bridges, storm drains and in the case of um, a storm drain it uh, it has a description of what a storm drain is and anything uh, that we're thinking of in storm drain is the underground infrastructure whose purpose is to convey storm water away from a pond area to somewhere where we can um, tolerate it. As a little bit on lift stations Reservoirs, which are not particularly commonly impacted, and lastly, stormwater quality. Uh, the big deals in uh, transportation infrastructure is controlling erosion and maintaining those erosion control devices. So that's a state level manual. So we've seen a city level, a county level, and now a state level. And I don't have a nice federal level to go to, so I'm not going to go to it. Um, and what you would find as you're looking through these is these are all referenced back to various original sources and again the prudent engineer would obtain copies of those sources so that as they're doing in the design they can trace the logic or the methodology back to an original source in the unlikely event that you end up in a court of law or on an episode of COPS, whichever comes first. Um, because stormwater involves a lot of agencies such as cities, counties, states, and federal governments, uh, when there's a flood and someone gets damaged, they, they round up all the lawyers and they start looking for other people's money. So these are always contentious projects. Um, your defense as a design engineer is to document the, the the crap out of everything um, so that you can say in front of attorneys I was using the standard accepted practice and procedure at the time of the design and construction and I didn't do anything fancy or exotic you're gonna to have to blame somebody else perhaps you could consider suing God um, moving back to uh, more uh, general stuff the project layout um, you'll notice that I spent time in, in most of the manuals um, showing you that there's a considerable amount of manual content that is aimed at explaining how drawings are to be submitted for approval. The engineering part, the actual layout, is somewhat flexible. Uh, that's determined by um, the engineer designer's creativity, uh, the access to right-of-way, in the actual hydraulic needs of, of the problem. Um, <clears throat> in making a design, we'd use some version of the following uh, flowchart. We'd set up a drainage network layout 
on the area plan. Aerial photos would be useful. And our initial lay layout may not be the one that eventually gets um, built, but we have to start somewhere. We'd use our hydrology information to determine peak discharges and or hydrographs at different locations in the study area. We would route those discharges through various conduits um, with or without built drainage system uh, in order to evaluate the need for drainage system capacity. We would project capacity for future expansion of service if um, that's deemed necessary. And um, then we would design our drainage infrastructure in an attempt to control ponding depth in the areas of interest. So that's our usual end game is item five. We want to, uh, we want to exercise some control over ponding. Uh, if we accept that a little ponding is tolerable, that actually makes the design process make the design process a little harder, but we can actually uh, produce better designs at lower constructed cost. Like um, water distribution networks, ultimately we end up building a model of it. Uh, the model might be quite simple, and in the model, again, it has nodes and links. A node is a junction point in a drainage system where discharge can be attributed or determined and assigned, and ponding depth can be specified and or calculated. And then computer models use these nodes to calculate the water surface elevation, the water quality, and uh, flow velocity. And uh, the values that these items take on are usually described in guidance documents. We saw in the Harris County Manual uh, that we were provided with maximum velocities depending on channel material type as an example. The practical design of a stormwater system without modeling software is actually quite possible and as long as the uh, system isn't too large scale or too elaborate. But uh, professional quality software is sufficiently inexpensive that there's really no need to thoroughly design a system without using a model. And hence, the guidance documents um, implicitly uh, demand a model. Commercial software uh, is usually quite a bit easier to use. And by all means, if you have access to commercial software, you should use it. Um, the computation engine is pretty much the same as the free software, but the commercial software has a vastly improved user interface. Existing data, we'll need to find existing data in order to determine drainage capacity. Uh, certainly we want to have a discussion with the ultimate owners of the system, uh, but we'll still have to calculate quantities. And uh, in that, we're going to have to appeal to all those documents that we uh, referred to already. And then eventually those go on a map. Uh, two of the three guidance documents we actually looked at explicitly described what has to be on that map. Um, and once we complete, that map can help us actually build the node locations and conduit dimensions for any physical structure that we're going to uh, schematize and attempt to uh, build. The selected conduit dimensions, so I'm using the word pipe here, but um, stormwater is conveyed in a variety of different types of conduits. Uh, the mighty pipe, of course, we also use um, swales, so you can think of those as, as channels that have a V-shape in their cross-section. We have natural channels, we have trapezoidal channels, and uh, a lot of variations in between. They're all conduits from the stormwater perspective. Uh, the dimensions and the shape greatly affect the system hydraulics. Um, in the case of uh, underground infrastructure, uh, we're going to have to use a trench and that's usually the biggest cost. And so the hydraulics uh, are used to set the conduit sizes for underground infrastructure and this stuff about fire protection has no place here. 
The location of junctions depends upon the planned layout of the project site and uh, the effect they will have on the hydraulic model. Collection, collection node locations have substantial effect on the overall model and they are a design feature. There's something that we select as designers. Likewise, conduit geometry is something else we select as designers. And we balance those two uh, in order to come up with a drainage design that can convey our estimated runoff at the prescribed annual recurrence interval effectively away from our area without uh, flooding. Um, it's important in these that we consider the existing drainage network. And in fact, it's vital. And, and by virtue of that, the process is usually more detailed than a pipe network because there's almost always a, a pre-development model to consider and then after we put in our drainage network. As a for instance, suppose we put our best effort into it and we find out that uh, the only drainage system we can afford to build uh, changes the depth of flooding in the neighborhood by an inch. Um, it's hardly worth spending the money on that. Um, so we're trying to get uh, big changes in uh, behavior. The conduit materials greatly affect system performance, more so than pressurized pipe systems. And uh, stormwater collection systems are usually built from reinforced concrete, if we're using natural or shaped channels, reinforced concrete pipe, ABS, PVC, HDPE, and a few other materials. Uh, the material that's not often used, steel and iron is not used in stormwater very much. Uh, they're far too expensive for the sizes that are necessary to uh, convey stormwater. Now they are they are likely used in lift stations, um, but those are relatively short force mains until we transition back to reinforced concrete or open channel. Uh, different jurisdictions uh, might specify particular materials and uh, obviously as a designer we need to ride, read the guidance documents for that specific locale. Uh, for instance, in the City of Houston Infrastructure Design Manual, if we'd read it thoroughly enough, um, there is a list of acceptable materials for, um, for lining sewer pipes. This is sanitary, but uh, the, the point is well taken. Um, and that list goes to the detail of product name, product vendor, and product manufacturer. So in some communities, uh, the material specification is quite precise and if you wish to use a material that's not specified you would have to contact the jurisdiction and obtain the necessary uh, permission to use that material. Uh, in many cases it's not worth doing it but if it's a large enough project it, it might actually be worth the effort if you can get a particular material that will outperform what is already accepted at a lower cost. And that is really all I had for today. On Tuesday, we're going to get into a review of open channel hydraulics. Uh, it should be a um, it should be a review from uh, material you had in fluid mechanics. And if you've already taken the open channel flow class, then it will totally be a review because um, we're trying to condense a lot of the features of that class into one or two uh, lessons here, and uh, we're moving on. In, in hopes to get to uh, our somewhere USA because we're going to want to model the drainage for that uh, neighborhood and see if the streets will convey enough water away that we don't have to build anything or if we have to su supply a storm drain system. Um, so if there's, if there's any questions, I'll take them now as I'm starting to uh, shut down the video. And if not, I will bid adieu to you shortly, so I can close that. I don't need to be in Blackboard anymore. I will stop my screen sharing. I will look at the Zoom chat. Okay, I don't see any questions, so either I've done a really great job or I put you all to sleep, uh, both of which can happen. And I will terminate the call. I want to thank you for your patience and attention in doing this whole class online. Uh, it's not as good as doing it face-to-face.
I know you're aware of that. I'm certainly aware of that. Uh, but we're making good progress, and um, I will look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. I want to wish you all a great weekend and remind you that there's an exam. The exam is, is scheduled to be due on, let me check that, it's supposed to be October 8th. So you have, you have seven days, not counting today. No, not now, cat. Really, five more minutes, dude. Five. You can't do it, can you? You just can't. You're a cat. I'm verifying that the uh, test due date is the 8th. Correct. It's due at it's due at 11:59 p.m. on the 8th of October. So, not counting today. Seven days to go. Um, and it, it's uh, like I said, it's not that uh, it's not intended to be a difficult test. I do want to advise you uh, because you have plenty of time. Read each question carefully um, and 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 think about. The answer because I have a, a tendency I'm not aware of it but others have told me that I, I word questions kind of um, funny and it and the initial answer doesn't really fit the wording so just read them carefully and you should be fine and with that I uh, wish you all a great evening and I will see you uh, on Tuesday all right goodbye